So we are the Imitation Learning Group. Uh, my name is Huang. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm Sanchi. And we are going to talk about Imitation Learning today, and in particular, um, as the professor said, Imitation Learning for Manipulative uh, Cognitive Robotic System. And so our topic is related to the Martian scenario. And in this scenario, as you all know, uh, Matt needs to figure out a way to get home. And in his journey, he has a lot of things uh, that he has to do. And certain things such as he needs to grow food, he needs to build and maintain machineries that support life on Mars. And maybe he needs to, he will need to navigate to the uh, extraction zone eventually. And it would be very helpful for Matt if he has robotic systems that help uh, him during his journey. Um, there are a few problems with this, uh, and or at least two problems, and the first one is very obvious. These systems are very complicated systems. You need um, a lot of motions, and there are a lot of different steps that are involved in making their system work. Um, the, these systems have a lot of different steps, and each step, Matt needs to tell the robot um, whether their system is doing the correct thing or not. And one way he may need to do so is assign a reward function for all these steps in uh, his system. Um, if their system is doing a correct thing, you would give it a high reward. And if it's not doing the correct thing, you would give it a very low or a negative reward. Um, which leads us to the next problem. A lot of these tasks, uh, the reward function is not readily available. A lot of these tasks, it is really hard to calculate the reward function. And so it's really difficult for Matt to train a robotic system that can easily help him uh, in his journey. And examples of certain tasks that has difficult reward function can actually really uh, be really a mundane task, such as picking up an object. When a human tries to pick up an object, you don't necessarily think of a reward function. You don't want to think that this is the correct position at every time step. And so, um, yes, for a very simple, um, simple task like that, it's really difficult to collect a reward function. Uh, on the slide here, we have uh, an example of walking. And like I said, it's very difficult to have a reward function that can uh, imitate this kind of behavior. So what we can do is we look at how human thinks about approaching these problems. Um, in the walking example, what, uh, what you see is that babies imitate walking from watching adults. And in real life ex examples as well, if you have a problem, what you may want to do is you go to an expert and then you imitate what the expert has previously done really, really well. And you try to imitate what that expert has done. So we want to use the same approach for um, for our robotic systems. We want to teach our robots how to do a task really, really well when we already know how to do that task. And so this is what uh, something that we would like their robot to be able to do. We, um, we simulate a behavior and the robots can just recognize the behaviors and imitate um, what the expert has previously done. So you can see how that would uh, really help Matt in his journey. Um, it gives thought to this new branch of, uh, of learning uh, robotics in robotics. And it's different from what previously was known as reinforcement learning. Um, in reinforcement learning, you try to have a lot of different trials and as the trials go on, um, you get a better reward function uh, out of, my bad, 
Um, in reinforcement learning, you do a lot of multiple trials and um, you try to f figure out what the best way to um, complete a task uh, as the trials go on. Um, you will get the, f the best reward out of your out of your uh, policies. Um, but in imitation learning, because you do not have that reward function, um, what you need uh, what you need is an expert that knows how to do the task, and you imp uh, and you implement a system that can translate um, the, what state you're in to a task uh, to an action that you need to do. So that is what we are going to do today. Um, so I already talked a bit about what imitation learning is and how it's different from reinforcement learning. Um, next we are going to talk about the, um, the different uh, types of imitation learning and in particular the behavioral cloning and inverse reinforcement learning. And um, in the end I will talk a bit more about meta-learning is an advanced uh, approach to imitation learning and gonna wrap things up uh, at the end as well. So I have the pleasure to present the, uh, the simpler method in imitation learning, um, which is behavioral cloning. And the core ideas of behavioral cloning is very simple. You don't have a reward function already, and, but you, already, you do have an expert that knows, um, that knows the policy. Um, you would assume that this expert is the optimal solution for, uh, for your problem, and you use this expert to learn a policy um, through imitating the expert uh, exactly. Um, so before I go into um, that uh, even more, um, I'd like to introduce MVP, which um, is a very popular framework for for analyzing uh, machine learning and robotics. Um, and in MVP, you have a lot of different states. These are the environments that um, your system can occupy. Uh, you have actions. Um, these are the set of actions that the system can take. Uh, you have transition models. Um, which is basically um, the probability of going from one state to another state given that you take a specific action. You have the reward function of achieving a state, but which in imitation learning, of course, um, is not available to you. Um, the policy is basically a mapping of the state <coughs> to the action. And the value function, um, the is the lifetime uh, value of your policy. Um, you would want to ma maximize this uh, value. So yes, uh, so in next sense, uh, for behavioral cloning, you would want to pair up uh, your state to the action. Um, your system needs to recognize what state it is in and then um, perform an, an appropriate action based on an expert that was already available. We are going to use the autonomous driving example here because um, in this uh, autonomous driving example you would have a very well defined racetrack and an expert that can navigate this racetrack. Um, so first, modeling the state. You uh, can model the state with the position of the car which can be x. Um, you can um, model the states with the velocity of the car and the acceleration of the cars. For even more information, you can have the camera video feed um, to recognize obstacles and um, on the road. For the actions, we have uh, these actions. Um, the car can speed up or slow down. Um, we can model the turn angle of the car um, at a very specific state. And uh, the expert. Um, so the expert would recognize at, um, at each position a certain velocity and acceleration what the car needs to do. Does it need to slow down? And what kind of angle the, the car needs to take? And so our t uh, the task for behavioral cloning is to map 
um, is to use the expert to map the state to the right action. Right. So just to summarize, you would um, train a policy to mimic the expert uh, action exactly, going from the state to the action. Um, and behavioral cloning is very simple to learn. Um, it's, you can just use supervised learning to get from, to have a mapping from your state to the action. And using this objective function, you can minimize the loss uh, between the optimal action and uh, your, your policy uh, given the state that you are in. The disadvantage of VRO cloning, and this is going to extend to the next slide as well, is basically you assume that there is no strong error when you actually perform these trials. Um, and if your expert doesn't have a very specific way to handle errors uh, when you roll out the experiment. Um, it may cause some very catastrophic uh, behavior uh, for your system. And, and so behavioral cloning is very good uh, to use when you have that a very small state space or an expert that fully cover all of your state spaces. Um, if you don't have an, a very good expert, or if your problem is very complicated, then behavioral cloning is really not the, the way that you want to, to use. Um, and to visualize this even more, um, if, you, if you remember from the previous slides, your expert covers a very defined set of trajectory. And in this problem, your car suddenly clear off track. And this presents uh, a new state to the problem. And because this is a new state that was not covered in uh, the previous expert, um, the system doesn't know what to do. And this, um, this is a very huge problem for your client. So to solve that, we can have interactive experts, which are variants of your cloning that can solve these kind of problems where, the ex where, um, where there may be Use errors when uh, when you roll out your experiment, and Andrew is going to cover those variants for behavioral cloning. Yeah, so Huang did a fantastic introduction uh, on behavioral cloning and how it can be applied to imitation learning. Uh, but of course, um, there are catastrophic mistakes that could happen if you slightly deviate from the states as induced by the exploit. Um, and let us uh, let me remind you guys what kind of framework that we are operating under. So we have an MDP with discrete states and discrete actions, and this makes a very easy uh, model for us to analyze. Um, depending on the classifier or how you model the problem, uh, you can probably uh, extend this to continuous states and continuous actions uh, with a small amount of effort. So uh, what is interactive exploit? In the behavioral cloning case, uh, you simply collected data from the exploit, and you assumed that the states and the actual execution is identical to the states as induced by the expert policy. So what does that mean? Uh, so you never, you, you make the assumption that you never, ever, ever deviate from the expert policy. But that's a very strong assumption. Uh, so as Huang introduced in the previous slides, if you have a call and you accidentally slightly deviate off the road, uh, you might not be able to correct that in the behavioral cloning case uh, because you never enter that and uh, you know entered into that state be, uh, previously. So how can we solve that problem? So uh, we're gonna introduce the idea of an interactive exploit. Uh, similar to behavioral cloning, uh, we use an exploit and we look at the actions and state mappings, uh, but an additional step is that we collect demonstrations and we ask the exploit uh, what it would do in every single state that I encounter in the actual rollout in the environment. So there are a few different variants. Uh, we will go over uh, three different algos. Uh, the first one is called Fool Training. It's called, uh, we, we, we gave it a nickname, so it's easier to remember. It's April Fool's Day. We hope you guys enjoy this. Um, first one is Fool Training. It's extreme handholding. Uh, and I'll go in, into that in more detail uh, in the future slides. And the next algorithm is called Data Aggregation, DACO. Uh, so what this does is basically you collect a lot of data and how you collect that data is very crucial 
uh, to the execution of Dagger. And finally, uh, we have mix and match, stochastic mixing. So this is a way, a training method, where you mix the policy. Uh, so how many of you guys saw Guardians of the Galaxy 2? It was an okay movie, I thought. <laughs> um, so uh, you might remember the scene uh, with uh, Rocket uh, in the quantum asteroid field where they uh, took over control from each other randomly and nearly destroyed them. Uh, but it turns out it's something that you want to do uh, in imitation learning, and that's one way you can collect uh, greater amounts of data. So any questions, comments, concerns? Wow, you guys are all experts in <laughs> imitation learning, but uh, let's go on. So for training, uh, in the behavior cloning case, you simply train one single uh, policy based on uh, multiple execution tra trajectories by the expert. So maybe the expert would uh, do like 10 drives, uh, starting off from different uh, initial states, and uh, you would train a very simple supervised learning algorithm on those 10 trajectories. Uh, but in forward training, instead of training, uh, in, in tra training on n trajectories and training one policy, uh, in forward training you train up to t policies, where t is the number of time steps, or in this case n actually, uh, time steps in the actual problem. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at this case. Um, let's assume that you start off from a random position, and at the first time step you start off from a random policy, uh, you execute it maybe 10 times, uh, and this is random, so uh, you end up in 10 different states. And at every single one of these 10 states, you will go to the expert and you will ask, hey, what should I do in this state? And this basically gives you the assumption that the state that you end up in has already been induced by the previous policies that you have learned. Uh, so this is a much stronger assumption than the behavioral cloning case where you, the policies induced are simply from the expert and not from you. So yeah, instead of training one policies, you train T policies, uh, where T is time horizon, and you ask the expert at every single time step. Uh, in the previous case, in the behavioral cloning case, as Huang introduced, um, you have up to quadratic regret, and this regret uh, error uh, compared to the expert. So this is compared to the expert. Uh, but in forward training, you can reduce that to linear. So in behavioral cloning, that's quadratic. In forward training, in a large set of cases, it's linear. But we also have disadvantages uh, because you do need to iterate over time and this is impractical when t can be very large uh, or it's non-deterministic or undefined. So let's take a look at the pseudocode. Uh, do not be scared, do not be intimidated, it's very simple. Uh, so you start off with t policies and if you imagine each policy as a neural network, this is just a t different initializations of weights. And at every single time step, uh, you start off from a few initial, uh, if it's the first state, you start off from an initial state distribution. And uh, you sample these trajectories uh, using, this pol uh, using each policy. And at every single time step t, you go and ask the expert, hey, what should I do in this case? And the expert gives you a state and an action. So this action comes from the expert policy, so that's the pi star and the state is the state as induced by you. And you train a classifier uh, based on the state uh, given so far. But you need to note that this policy is non-stationary. So this policy does not only take in state as an input, it also takes in time as an input. So that's what allows us to learn t different policies. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, great. You guys are smart. I love you guys. So next, data aggregation, DAGO. Uh, you can tell that machine learning people really like these uh, fancy names. Uh, they, uh, anyways, so data aggregation, what is, what is this? Uh, in the previous case, you had to learn a different policy at each different time step, and I said that would be impractical in many different cases. Uh, so what DAGO does is instead of collecting, uh, training T different policies, you learn one policy, uh, but you do that by collecting a lot of data. And uh, you collect this data, and by collecting a lot of data and training a policy on that, uh, you get a better policy that actually works in all possible set of states as induced by your policy. So yeah, instead of learning key policies, you aggregate data, you collect a lot of data. 
And you start off using some random policy similar to the previous case, and you train a policy using this data. But because this is just a random policy, it might be bad, it might be impractical. So uh, what you do is, uh, based on the previous policy and uh, the expo policy, you iteratively collect more data. Uh, and similar to the full training case, uh, we have linear uh, regret, linear error, uh, compared to the quadratic error in the behavior cloning case. Uh, but there are still disadvantages. Uh, so what kind of policy do you use at, at a given iteration to collect the data? Uh, remember, we have two policies. We have our current best policy, uh, our current uh, most up-to-date policy, and we also have the expert policy. Uh, so Dago, at each step, you need to pick uh, do I use my policy or do I use the exploit policy to collect data? And that, uh, as you can imagine, is simply a hyperparameter that you can tune and you can pick. Uh, but you know, if you have done a grid search on hyperparameters before, it's very expensive. It's it's not fun. Um, and you also do need to collect a lot of data. Dago data aggregation. It's in the name. Yeah. So let's take a look at the pseudocode. So you initialize an empty set D. So this, this is simply a list, a container, a dictionary uh, for the data that you collect. And you start off with a random policy. Uh, and in the neural, cat, neural net case, random weights. And N is simply how many times you do this, uh, how many times you collect data. So what is the actual policy that you use at a certain time step? Uh, this policy is actually, uh, you randomly choose between the export policy and your current best policy, your current most recent policy. And this beta is a hyperparameter that, we, uh, that I mentioned previously that you had to tune. And you can imagine this as a beta. It's a weighted coin. And uh, if you throw a, uh, flip a coin, and it comes up heads, export policy, tails. It's, uh, it's the current most recent policy. And uh, after you have this uh, policy out of two, you decide on one. Uh, you can sample uh, these trajectories using this policy, and you can collect data. And regardless of the re regardless of the data that you collected, whether it's from the most recent policy or the export policy, you go to the export and say, "In these states, what should I do?" And uh, you, you you using this data set, using these state action pairs, you append it to this current data set, and you end up with a bigger data set. And you can train a classifier on all of the data that you have so far and you iterate. So as you iterate, you end up with a policy uh, that induces states that are closer to close, uh, that, that is closer and closer at test time uh, as it is to training time. So at the very end, uh, you might have uh, n different policies, where n is how many policies you trained, and you can simply pick the best uh, using validation. So finally, uh, we will introduce uh, one last algorithm called SMILE. And this is called uh, stochastic mixing, uh, iterative learning. In the previous case, you may have noted that we did a random choice of policy. Uh, and this is a hard choice. We either pick one uh, or the other. But it does not have to be that way. Uh, if you remember the image from Guardians of the Galaxy, and I mentioned uh, people taking control randomly, uh, this is basically what we do. We have an expo policy, and we have our current best policy, and we switch. Uh, be between them at uh, different time steps, uh, and we by by switching, uh, we collect more data. So yeah, instead of uh, in the dagger case, you collected a bunch of data on trajectories. Uh, in, in, instead of that, we do we mix policies, uh, and you start off maybe by mimicking export policy, or you can also uh, start with a random policy. It's up to you. And uh, using this mixed policy, uh, you can induce new trajectories in the, in the environment. And uh, once you have these new trajectories, you can go and ask the expert, uh, what should we do in every single case? What should we do in every single state? And by asking the expert, you can create a new policy. And you take that policy and the old policy, and you mix them. Uh, and what, you, what people usually do is uh, people usually start off completely following the expert policy. Uh, but as you train, as you iterate, uh, you, you decrease the weight of the export policy, and you increase the weight of uh, our policy. And similar to the previous two cases, 
we have linear uh, regret error uh, for a very large set of problems, uh, but there are also disadvantages. Uh, due to, uh, because we are mixing policies, uh, it's stochastic, so it might not be reproducible. Uh, but in practice, this is not a huge problem uh, because in these problems, the state is usually so large, uh, it's so non-deterministic that it might not be reproducible anyways. Uh, so yeah, uh, but there's also one disadvantage that is not listed here, and can anybody imagine what that is? Nobody? Come on, you guys are smarter than this. Michael, I see, I see something. No, I was just thinking of if you uh, collect all the trajectories, but, but that's a, a disadvantage for all the methods. Yes. yes. Um, how do you make sure that that what what you learn fits the context? Because you have a certain trajectory, but every turn is different, and there are many many other parameters that you don't take into account. So how do you do this? That's a fantastic question. And uh, that's the key to the three methods that we introduced uh, following behavioral cloning. So behavioral cloning, you assume that the test time trajectory is identical to the training time trajectory as given to you by the expert. Uh, but that's a very strong, maybe impossible assumption in uh, real life. So what in the three methods that we talked about, this is three different ways to collect data from the environment. Uh, and we try to collect as much diverse data as possible uh, in a few different ways. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. Anyways, one of the disadvantages is uh, I saw a paper on, uh, from a cloud company, I believe it, it was SAKE. Uh, it was a DELPA project anyways. Uh, they noticed that people got very easily disoriented uh, when switching between the expert policy, aka the human, and the current best loan policy. So you can imagine on highway you're driving, suddenly you lose control of the car, that's very scary. Yeah? Uh, does the mixing, I'm trying to implicitly, I'm, so it seems like what you're essentially trying to do with this mixing policy is like making up for lack of data essentially by like kind of sort of interpolation basically. Yeah, so this so is three different ways of interpolation, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, what sort of problem structure, like what in the problem makes this sort of, inter I mean that, for that to work it implicitly means that there's some sort of structure in the problem that you're exploiting. Do you know about what, more about what that is? Could you clarify what you mean? Okay, so like, so like if you have the, for you to be able to interpolate like this, it uh, means that it must be some sort of simplicity, and like there's a sort of regularity yeah. in what the solution is. I see what you mean. You're asking how we mix the policy? Is that what you are No, asking? I mean like why does mixing the policy not scramble? Like thing, like you're implicitly making a sort of assumption about what the problem is. I yeah. kind of understand, and I think it's still related to how we mix it. Uh, so yes, we are assuming some kind of structure in the problem, and people have different strategies of mixing. Some people say you change uh, at every single time step, and others model it as some kind of Gaussian distribution, and you do a mixture of Gaussians. <coughs> uh, but yeah, you do have to come up with some kind of strategy to actually mix the policies. So let's take a look at the pseudocode. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but you know, I try my best. <laughs> um, so uh, you initialize. Uh, the first policy uh, as the expert policy. So this is what we talked about previously. You start off by mimicking expert policy and eventually you decrease that weight and you increase the weight of our current policy. Uh, and at uh, the first time step, um, you execute that policy to collect some data and you train a classifier on that similar to the behavioral cloning case. Uh, but the next policy that you have uh, is a mixture of the expert policy. This is the one minus alpha and the current best policy that we have, that's the other, other part. Um, and you iterate, uh, you do this for n trials, and at the very end, you need to subtract away the components of the expo policy uh, that is kind of mixed in. Uh, and you can do that via a, a weighted, weighted um, multiplication and subtraction. And finally, you return the uh, mixture of all policies that you have learned so far. So yeah, uh, I have introduced uh, three different methods for behavioral cloning, full training, um, DACO, and uh, SMILE. And this is, uh, these are all methods that are much more complicated uh, than simple behavioral cloning, uh, but it allows you to be more adaptable in large state spaces. Uh, so uh, now I will turn it over to uh, Sanchit.
and uh, he will talk about uh, ILL. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, are these methods limited by the skill of your expert? <coughs> so if you have an expert that's just a bad driver, like they take turns too sharply or something, can it actually learn then to improve the skill by training on it, or is you still limited by that? So that's a fantastic question. And uh, Sanchit will talk about how you can actually do planning. Uh, what we actually learned in this case, we cannot extend uh, further based on, uh, because we are limited by the export, we have to assume uh, we are trying to learn the distribution of the export as good as possible. So you cannot plan, uh, it's simply brute force iteration. Yeah? Uh, in the paper that you've seen, um, uh, where you mentioned the problem that the human was sometimes confused who's in charge, was the human informed that he has to take over control and, one, uh, and when a company will take over control? Yes, they will. <coughs> so they knew that this would happen and they were still disoriented. Uh, so it really tells us how humans are not perfect, uh, even as an expert. Yeah? Uh, really, to the question about generalizing, so to clarify, none of these methods do any kind of learning of like a reward function, right? Yes, yeah, so... Uh, so Yeah, that's a fantastic observation. Uh, in all of these cases, we are simply trying to learn di uh, distribution of the export policy uh, as best as we can, and uh, we are not doing any kind of planning uh, whatsoever. Yeah, so anyways. Okay, so uh, Andrew Huang just covered behavioral coding and the interactive expert. Uh, what these two methods do is they basically uh, continually query the expert, and based on that, just try to learn what the best policy is, uh, based on what the experts have been doing so far. And I'm going to talk about a completely different approach to tackling imitation learning. And this is called inverse reinforcement learning. It tackles the same problem, uh, but it addresses a different issue. Right? The biggest issue with the problem is that we don't necessarily have access to any sort of reward function. Um, and kind of as was identified <laughs> with the previous question, uh, we could also just look at the problem and say, like, hey, what if we can find that reward function? Okay, and that's essentially the idea behind inverse reinforcement learning, right? If we don't have a reward function, we're going to look at what the expert does and try to recover what the reward function should be. The problem is, it's not entirely obvious that we can even do this. Okay, uh, the entire thing is the entire thing that we've been telling you is that we don't give you a reward function. So how is it possible to then get back the reward function if that's like the entire thing that's missing? So in order to get some intuition on this, I will turn to the hype of March Madness and the upcoming. NBA playoffs and talk about basketball. So let's imagine someone who's never seen a basketball game in their life before, okay? And now they're watching one for the first time, and importantly, they don't have access to a reward function, so they can't see the scores. And what they are trying to figure out while looking at this sport is, at what state, what do people have to do in order to score points, in order to get that reward? So if someone's looking at a basketball game um, for the first time without access to the scores, they may see something like this, right? You'll see the state of the ball going through the hoop and then the heat celebrating, or the ball not going through the hoop and the heat not celebrating. Okay, and that's like a fairly intuitive thing you can see in how someone might, someone watching a basketball game without the score might figure that out. The problem is checking which team is celebrating is still some sort of a course reward function. Sure, it isn't telling you how many points the team got, but it's telling you like, hey, this team's happy versus sad, right? So we can't actually use that, but it'll motivate where the expert comes in. Because that gets into our expert assumption. And kind of to address the previous question, um, one of the core things in all of these methods for imitation learning is a, for now, fairly strict assumption that the expert is always optimal. I'll talk about how we can relax that uh, a little bit uh, later. But yes, we ultimately do, do need an expert that's at the very least close to optimal because the system starts out not knowing what's happening. Um, so if you see someone who consistently blunders, it'll learn that and think that that's either the right action or just not be able to learn anything at all. Maybe but with the ex, sorry. sorry. Can I just ask you a couple of set of questions? So why, learn, why do we want to learn the reward function? Right, so we want to learn the reward function. There's kind of a distinction here, which I'll talk about uh, in immediate versus lifetime reward function, which I'll get to in a few slides. The idea is that if we can learn the reward function, we can uh, kind of use standard techniques on market decision processes to try and figure out what the best course of action is, right? And the idea is this is more generalizable because now even if you haven't seen what the expert has done in previous cases, if you have a reward function, you can then say like, oh, well, in this case, uh, this will give me the highest reward. Okay, so, so your story is either we learn the model and then use planning, 
mm -hmm. correct? Which is what, what, a, what an MVP approach is doing, right? Or we right. try to learn the policy directly, right? The other two parts where we'll learn the policy directly, you would argue that if we, in some cases, if we learn the model directly, right, and then apply planning, that that'll perform better than learning the policy directly. Uh, yeah, in some cases, uh, that's, I don't know about better, but the idea is that's an easier formulation of a problem. And I'll talk about uh, which um, case is this problem. Um, inverse reinforcement <coughs> learning applies to better, in which cases is the imitation, uh, the, sorry, the interactive expert and behavioral cloning apply to better. With the very end of this, I'll give you an entire doubt on who has the best effort, right? <laughs> Somewhat. There's a okay, surprise so, ending there. So, <laughs> so, but we would like to kind of know when, when, when it's better to learn the model and plan versus kind of of course. Learn it directly. But presumably the reason why there's all this attention to inverse reinforcement learning lately versus all the work in reinforcement learning, which is learning the policy directly, right, mm -hmm. is, is, is that it's performing better. Yeah, and that it, it kind of comes to the ideal, like, if you can get what the ideal reward function is, that would be great, and you basically leave it into your main problem as to why uh, you have to learn it through imitation rather than just a standard reward function approach. Okay. Then my, um, second, my second question. Okay. Right, which is the model has two pieces, right? Which is a transition relation and the reward function. So here yes. you're focusing on learning the reward function. You didn't mention the transition function, so or transition relation. So right. So why all the attention to the reward function and not the transition relation? Okay, so I'll uh, dive a bit deeper into this when I actually explain how the algorithm works. But um, the big thing and kind of the big uh, difference as to when you want to use uh, something like the interactive expert versus reinforce inverse reinforcement learning is that um, in inverse reinforcement learning, there's not only a strong uh, expert assumption, which is saying that the expert is optimal, but there's also, uh, it also works uh, best when you have a very well-defined um, Markov decision process, right? So you have a lot of well-defined states, you know exactly what kind of transitions you can have between states. And that's different than a problem of, say, driving a car, where there are a lot more states and a lot more unpredictability. So I thought you would have given an I mean, so if I wanted to apply an MVP technique, then I would need to know the transition relation and the immediate reward function, right? And you could tell me how to learn the immediate reward function. I would presume, but I would still need the transition relation. So I right. your so answer would be that's easy to learn. The hard thing to learn is the immediate reward. That's why all, there's all the attention on immediate reward. Yeah, so in terms of recovering the immediate reward, um, the kind of the base case of inverse reinforcement learning, without going into any complicated extensions that are probabilistic, is when you know exactly what the possible transitions between states are. But you still have to learn it. Uh, or, or, or a human is given. In, in what I'm presenting, uh, it's not something that's learned. It's kind of something that's known as a problem constraint. Um, there's some extensions where you can learn that somewhat probabilistically. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a Given that uh, there are pre, I guess just sort of building on this, what uh, the professor was saying, um, it seems like this is kind of avoiding the hard part of the problem. Like, the, if your goal is to make a planner, it seems like learning the reward function is the hard part. You sh like the principal issues would be first just the planning problem and then learning the transition probability. There right. are those sorts of things that do this, like. Um, uh, inverse planning with probabilistic programming, things like that. Um, in what sort of situation, given that we're thinking here in terms of making a robotics system, not like a social interaction system, um, would you really want to do inverse reinforcement learning? All right, so you kind of uh, correctly identified that the hard part is finding the set of transitions and whatnot, but if we already do have a a uh, fairly good idea of what the transitions are and recover that easily, um, then it is uh, easier to then try and uh, find the reward function directly, which is what this approach tries to do. Um, the examples that I've kind of, uh, that I'll be talking about in terms of where this is applicable, um, don't strictly uh, come from robotics, right? They come from more like things like games where the states are per fairly well defined in terms of either motion or chess where you can move a piece to a certain spot. Uh, but you can imagine some sort of um, robotic system where you divided, instead of having kind of a, let's say something with motion, instead of say, saying that in motion you have a, um, you know, a variety of things that can happen, if you say discreti discretize your state space and then think about um, transitions between um, spots in that state space, uh, then you can um, get a fairly solid idea of what your possible transitions at every state are. 
right? And once you have a solid idea of what your transitions are, then the idea is that finding the reward function is kind of the um, kind of the easier path compared to finding the best policy. Okay, so um, kind of continuing with the intuition, um, one of the core things that's necessary in order to um, even be able to recover this reward function is the assumption that the expert is always optimal. Okay, and in this case, you could have an expert like Dwayne Wade, and then suddenly what you get is something like this, right? With Dwayne Wade, the ball will always go through the hoop, and then you don't have to necessarily see the celebration to know that that's what, say, the expert in this case wanted to do, right? So the very fact that the expert does something is in and of itself a course reward function, right? And that's kind of the key insight that we're going to be using in order to then try and uh, find the reward function um, given the set of states and uh, transitions. So I'll formulate kind of what we have in this problem, right? What the problem setup is. Uh, and then from there, I'll talk about the applications of it. Um, it's kind of as we've talked about in the problem setup, we have a Markov decision process. And importantly, unlike with behavioral cloning and the interactive expert, in this case, uh, we have a Markov decision process where we already know all of the states and all of the possible actions, right? So the idea of what the transitions are and figuring that out or getting to a state that we don't know um, aren't necessarily relevant to this formulation of the problem. Okay, so let's say we already know what the states are and where we can go from each state, right? So an example of this might be um, a game or something like chess. And then from there, what we're trying to find is the immediate reward function. And now is what I'm going to talk about a distinction between immediate and um, lifetime reward function. Um, when you're playing a game, you want to generally optimize your lifetime reward function, right? Even if you aren't getting a reward in the next step, if that leads you to like a reward of a million two steps from now, that's probably pretty good, right? Um, and the idea is that you can find that by looking at a Markov decision process and the types of transitions you can have between states uh, and um, figuring out um, what path through those states will give you the highest lifetime reward if you have the immediate reward. What's easier to find in inverse reinforcement learning is not the lifetime reward, but the immediate reward. So the goal that we're going to try and um, solve is what is the reward associated with each state? Right, so in the basketball example, the state would be if a ball goes through the hoop, there's some reward associated with that. Okay? Um, and that's essentially what our problem formulation is. We have the expert's input, which in this case is going to be what action to take at every state. Um, we have the states and transitions kind of already known to us. And then we're going to be try to f trying to figure out what the uh, immediate reward at each state is, um, given those two inputs. Does that make sense? I should also pause here to note that the expert input in this formulation of the problem is slightly different than in the interactive expert and behavioral cloning. In the interactive expert and behavioral cloning, we're given expert trajectories, basically what will the expert do throughout the course of the problem. And in this case, what I'm saying is that the expert can tell us what the best thing to do at each state is. Uh, there's a modification to this, which allows you to take in trajectories and um, figure out the best reward functions, but I'll talk about that later and it's kind of it's harder to come from that angle um, to what I'm introducing this concept. And uh, with applications, like I said, we have a defined set of states and a defined set of transitions. So some of the best applications for this are cases where you have um, where you have exactly that, which tend to be uh, game type things. You can have a, a game such as chess, where you can imagine um, that each of the states is the positions of all of the pieces on the board. And from there, there's a very deterministic set of things that you can do with the pieces that are on the board. And you can also have um, a slightly, seemingly more general problem, such as Pac-Man, where you still kind of have defined transitions as to where you can move from each state. Um, but that's still kind of well known as to what the states are, right? what, what the positions on the board are, as well as um, what the um, central movements are at every point on the board. Okay. So yeah, in a case where uh, the states and transitions are not as well defined, inverse reinforcement learning generally doesn't work as well. So let's talk about what the problem setup looks like at the get-go. Okay, so we generally have a Markov decision process, and we have our expert input, which tells us what the state, uh, what the best action at each state is. Okay, so this is our Markov decision process, and what I'm, and in this case, I've shown you what the immediate reward function looks like. When you generally get this problem, you won't have the reward function because that's what we're trying to recover. Um, but let's just say we have a Markov decision process where at each state you can take one of two actions, uh, orange or blue. Uh, and what we're trying to find is what the reward, the immediate reward at each state is based on the expert's uh, optimal actions. Okay, 
Uh, I'll note one thing about the actions, which is that they can be deterministic or probabilistic, and you kind of see that here with the transition from state zero. The orange action deterministically, basically with prob probability one, goes to state two, but the blue action uh, can go with probability 0.4 at a state one, probability 0.6 at state two. And that's totally fine and works well with the um, algorithm that I'll soon be showing you. Any questions about the setup of the problem and what we're trying to recover? And then from there, we need to introduce the concept of a transition matrix. <laughs> uh, the transition matrix is kind of uh, what we've been talking about, where um, it defines how we can move through our state space, right? If we're at one state, what can we do to get to other states? Um, and in particular, how do certain actions affect what state we end up in, right? So a transition matrix, what it does is it takes a set of source states and a chosen action of them and then maps them to what the destination state or probability distribution over the destination state is. Okay, so in this case, if we take the actions orange at states zero and one, and blue at state two, then we can just follow uh, along this markup decision process and see that the orange line in this case goes to state two, the orange line from state one goes to state two, and the blue line from state two goes to state zero, right? And what the what the transition matrix does is it basically maps that uh, in matrix form, say that with probability one for this action we go to state two, with probability one for this action we go to state two, and probability one for this action we go to state zero. Okay? This basically encodes a set of actions um, and then kind of what destination states they map to. And given this formulation of what the transition matrix is, um, there's a special transition matrix that I want to talk about, which is the optimal transition matrix. This is simply taking the best actions, according to the expert, at every state, in this case blue, orange, and orange, and then mapping what the distribution over the destination states is for each of those actions. Okay? Does that make sense? The idea is that the expert's optimal actions should always be better than um, non-optimal actions. Right? So we want to formulate some sort, of, uh, some sort of algorithm, some sort of set of constraints, which enforces the fact that the optimal actions should always be better than the non-optimal actions. This is where the strong expert assumption comes in, where we are assuming that the expert is necessarily always optimal compared to other actions. Um, and ultimately, once we have all of these constraints, the idea is that we're going to have a bunch of constraints on uh, what a reward function should be, so we can combine them using a linear program solver and ultimately recover some sort of reward function that maps well to what the expert's actions are. Oh, Questions about that idea? Cool. So we'll go into the algorithm from here. Uh, it's going to, for, uh, my eyes glazed over when I looked at it the first time, but I'm going to work through an example, and it's going to make a lot more sense uh, kind of as we talk through it. So can you, can you just repeat that core idea again? What is, what is the <coughs> what is the LP that you're solving? Right? So what are the constraints? Right? How is that going to be? How are you expecting the reward by solving the LP? Right. So the uh, fundamental ideological constraint is that the opt is that the expert's actions are optimal, so therefore should always be better than the non-optimal actions. Right. So the idea is that any action you can take that's not what the expert's actions are should give you a worse um, lifetime score than the expert's actions. Um, and the idea is that's fundamentally a constraint. So if you formulate this in terms of the transition matrices and calculate out what the lifetime reward should be, uh, you end up getting a um, well, essentially a linear constraint, which I'll be showing in the next slide. OK, and this brings us to our core algorithm. It borrows a lot from the core idea, which is just that we First, create our optimal transition matrix. We then create non-optimal transition matrices, and then simply uh, add constraints for every non-optimal transition matrix that claims that our optimal one, when the reward function is applied, will give us a higher lifetime value. Okay, that's all that this constraint says. I'll be going through the terms of this constraint to say to kind of talk about where it comes from. Um, I know this kind of looks like a long, uh, scary matrix equation. But it turns out to actually just encode exactly the fact that we want the lifetime values for our optimal actions to be higher than the lifetime values for non-optimal actions when we apply a reward function R. Okay. 
Um, so I'll talk about what that looks like uh, with an example on the next slide. Before that, I want to talk about uh, subtlety in point two, and it has to do with the non-optimal transition matrices. So let's uh, say we have a set of actions, and I'm going to go to more than two actions for each state. Um, and let's say we have a set of actions A, B, and C for state 0 and state 1. Right? And in both cases, let's say A is optimal. So then clearly our optimal transition matrix is just going to be um, the rows corresponding to these actions. And then there's a question of how many non-optimal transition matrices do you need? Right? And off the bat, it seems like we're going to have to look at every single combination of non-optimal actions. But it actually turns out that you can do better than that. Right? You can just take the set of B actions and the set of C actions as your two non-optimal <laughs> matrices. It's not entirely obvious why we can do this, um, but the short answer is just that uh, if you do look at every possible combination, you're going to get a lot of repeated constraints. Right? And if the constraints repeat themselves, then it's not necessarily useful as a new constraint. So it turns out that doing that just kind of matching um, the sets of non-optimal actions and making sure that each of them is included in at least one non-optimal transition matrix is sufficient uh, for getting all of the constraints that you will get out of this problem. Which is kind of nice because um, if you had, say, eight possible actions, you're looking at seven times seven sets of possible non-optimal actions, right? Just for two states, right? So seven to the power of the number of states you have, right? Which kind of increases uh, fairly quickly. But what this claims is that as the number of actions increases, the number of transition matrices, the number of constraints that you're getting, increases only linearly, okay? Which kind of significantly uh, decreases the number of constraints um, that I end up dealing with. Does that make sense? It does lead to another problem on the opposite side, though, which is that this is a very under-constrained um, problem, and therefore the reward function that you get won't necessarily be deterministic, and I'll be talking about that through the example in a moment. Mm -hmm. it's still, is it still exponential in the number of states, though? Um, not for the number of transition matrices. Um, the number of constraints, it's linear in the number of states. Uh, but for the number of transi transition matrices, because the transition matrices um, basically have one row mapping to each state and its action, uh, you still get just one larger transition matrix for more states. But yeah, the fact that the transition matrix is larger it comes with a, uh, it does add to runtime on the constraint side. Okay, so let's work through an example of this, and um, I'm going to try to write a little harder because I realized that, that might have been a bit light, particularly for that side. Um, so I'm going to talk about what this fundamental uh, constraint looks like. We have our optimal policy minus any non-optimal policy times this cryptic term, which is the identity matrix, minus the Gaussian times the optimal matrix, and then the inverse of that. And then all of this, we take our word function, uh, apply it to that, and then the fundamental constraint is that this has to be greater than zero. I'm going to work through the terms and then talk about what this looks like, uh, and then uh, work through what an example of this looks like. This is simply comparing your two transition matrices. This is simply your immediate reward function. But like I said, the expert's actions are optimal not in the space of immediate reward, but in the space of lifetime reward. Okay? So this term in the middle takes an immediate reward and uh, turns it into what the lifetime reward could be. And specifically within that, this is just the identity matrix. This is the optimal actions. And then this is a decay term. The gamma, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's a decay term which says that rewards now are better than rewards later. Right? So if someone says, I can give you five bucks now or five bucks 10 years in the future, uh, you probably want the five bucks now before you even consider things like inflation and whatnot, right? So this is just a decay term on the idea that you probably want to um, get rewards now rather than later, and it kind of uh, shows how this term comes from the transition from immediate to lifetime reward. Make sense? And now let's work through the example that I just showed you. We have this Markov decision process and this uh, set of best actions from every state, 
And we have, in this case, because there are two actions at every state, we have exactly one non-optimal transition matrix and one optimal transition matrix. We'll always have one optimal transition matrix, but in this case, we have two minus one, one non-optimal transition matrices. Right, which means you can just plug in these two terms into our equation. Um, and what we end up getting is the optimal transition matrix minus the non-optimal one times a matrix inverse that I can't compute in my head or on the board, so I'm just going to jump to the solution, times the reward function that we're trying to find. Right. And um, that ends up working out to something like minus 0 0.16, 0 0.34, and minus 0 0.18 um, as the top row of this matrix. And then we have our reward function vector, which is R0, R1, and R2. And the idea is that this has to be squiggly greater than 0. Squiggly greater than just means that each term in this resultant vector has to be greater than 0. Um, and I'll also note that in this case, this is a simple case. I didn't want to deal with a full matrix here. Um, so the actions, um, orange and blue for both state 1 and state 2, map to the same thing, which is why these bottom two rows are all zero. In a case where you actually have a choice of actions at those spots, you'll get a full um, three by three matrix without any zero terms. But in this case, you get the idea where you get one constraint from the one case where you have two actions that, are, that differ. Right, and this turns out to just be essentially some sort of linear constraint, 0.34 R1 minus 0.18 R2 has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? This top term in our matrix has to be greater than or equal to zero. And we've done this entire problem, formulated what our constraint should be, and got in just this, right? But mainly because the other two rows are also zero, but we've gotten something like this, which is fundamentally a plane. And what we're looking for is, you know, all that this says is that the reward function has to be on one side of that plane, right? Which is what I mean by this is fairly under constraint. Even if you had more constraints, um, you can imagine that all you're doing is drawing lines in a space. I can't draw planes, I'm just going to look at a 2D space. But you can imagine that you're just drawing lines in a space. And even with a ton of these lines and whatnot, there's still a fairly large region above all of those lines where a reward function can live. Right? So the idea is that the reward function has an infinite number of solutions and isn't constrained at all. Um, and furthermore, the problems run deeper than that. Let's talk about where reward functions work. So we have this fundamental constraint on the board, which says that every term in our resultant product should be, greater, should be greater than or equal to zero. And there's a very simple reward function that satisfies that. The zero vector. If you plug in the zero vector into anything like this, your resultant vector is going to be all zeros, which technically is all greater than or equal to zero. At the same time, that's not a very helpful reward function because it basically says that nothing happens at, every, at any state. Um, so you probably want to avoid that, which leads to our first fix, which is not only saying that the optimal actions are better than non-optimal actions, but saying that trying to maximize how much better they are. Right? So saying that there should be a significant gap between the optimal action and the non-optimal actions, which is an even stronger form for expert assumption in some sense. And there's a second problem with this, which is that you can have a reward function of, say, 0, 1, and 2, and that will map to exactly the same set of actions as a reward function that's 0, 1,000, and 2,000. So it's kind of a linear scaling problem. Um, and there are kind of two concurrent approaches that are used to this. The first is setting an upper bound on what the maximum reward value can be. And the second, in order to set terms that should be 0 to 0 rather than something like 0 0.001, uh, is an idea borrowed from um, linear regression, which is where we normalize, so, sorry, where we use a, where we penalize we penalize based on a norm that basically sets small terms to zero and penalizes you if you have a small term in uh, your reward vector. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of that, but the idea is that we want simple reward functions that are scaled reasonably well. So do these two things conflict with each other? Uh, it seems like the uh, solving problems one and two, because if you're maximizing the difference between them, but you're also limiting how high it can be, it just, they just seem to conflict. Right, so if you maximize how much higher the scores are subject to a scaling value, um, 
then he can get a reward function like this. And then once he gets a reward function like this, there's no distinguishing between this and this. So then the second part it helps you uh, restrict that to the kind of simpler version of that reward. And these are some improvements. They take away some of the, I guess, somewhat more obvious issues with the reward function, but it's still kind of an infinite number of reward functions that you can potentially get. Um, so I'm going to talk about doing better. And this involves an idea of maximum entropy. Um, that's kind of a scary word, so, but it actually comes down to a fairly simple idea. Right? The idea is that all you know is that the expert's actions are better than the non-optimal actions. You don't know which non-optimal actions are better than other non-optimal actions, right? So what this says is that all non-optimal actions, in the absence of other information, um, should have equal lifetime rewards, right? Where you're not overly committing to one non-optimal action being better than the other. It turns out this adequately constrains the problem and empirically leads to reward functions that work quite well. Does that make sense? The, um, I'm impressed, or surprised really, I guess, that it empirically works well. Is that dependent to some degree on there being a, on the probabilistic nature of the world model because it's effectively smoothing out the reward? Or is it just that you're not really, position, it's not really dependent on having local information for finding out reference data? Yeah, so it's, I don't fully understand why this works better, but um, my intuitive understanding of why I think this may work better is something similar to that, right? Let's say you have two non-optimal actions, A and B, and B is a lot better than A in the real world. Well, if you try to take, if you try to, um, sorry, if you don't set the non-optimal lifetime values equal, then you can have the case that's good where you say that B is better. Right? But you can also have the case that's very bad which says that A is better, right? And kind of a nice compromise between the two, not knowing which one should be better, is kind of saying like, okay, well, let's say they're equal, and that on average works out better um, than, uh, that on average, I guess, works out better than, you know, over committing to one um, policy. Uh, so I mentioned the word of maximum entropy here, and it just has to do with how they actually implement the idea that not all non-optional actions should have the same lifetime reward. Uh, but the reason I mentioned maximum entropy is because some of the state of the art in inverse reinforcement learning uh, involves neural nets. Um, and specifically, it involves neural nets because maximizing entropy is a paradigm that neural nets are very good for. Right? Uh, there was kind of a problem of unsupervised learning, uh, where you aren't given labels and you ask a neural net to try and figure out differences between pictures, essentially. Um, and in something like that, uh, what ended up working very well is a neural net that maximized entropy. So using the same formulation of maximum entropy between the non-optimal actions, uh, you can get similar types of neural nets to work very well for finding reasonable reward functions. And finally, uh, let's talk about just a few more extensions of this. Um, we, th I talked about the base algorithm, uh, which is kind of the core idea. Uh, but the idea is that you can take inverse reinforcement learning and apply it to more problems than just that. Uh, the first is, what's, let's say you have example trajectories instead of um, just the best action at every state, which is what we had in behavioral cloning of the interactive expert. Um, in that case, what you can do is you can take the example trajectories, kind of probabilistically figure out what your best action should be, and then from there do the problem exactly as we just did. Um, there's a second uh, problem where you can say, what if you have an infinite but kind of deterministic set of states, right? So let's say the set of states is the number of um, integer points on a coordinate plane, right? They're technically an infinite number of points, so it's very easy to know what those points should be. Um, so in cases like that, what you can actually do is instead of looking at all of the states, you can look at the linear algebra basis of those states, right? Zero, one in one direction, and one, zero in the other direction, and then just operate on the best action um, using that. Um, and then finally, is kind of the problem that the expert assumption is very strong, which is, you know, relying on an expert to always be optimal is kind of unrealistic, especially in some games like chess. Uh, so you can relax that where you can say the expert is, you know, say better than 80% of other non-optimal actions, um, which ends up being fine kind of for the constraint um, formulation of this problem and still mathematically kind of um, works out in terms of constraints, but does kind of give you an even worse form of the under-constraint problem because now not only are you dealing with this region, you're dealing with regions kind of all around this for your experts on optimal tolerance, right? So suddenly you're dealing with an already under-constrained problem, making it even less constrained to permit the idea that the expert may not always be 
those are just some um, extensions of reinforcement learning, as well as kind of the state of the art, which involves the maximum entropy neural net. Um, and now Huang's going to talk about reconciling the two methods, as well as some further work in the area. All right, guys, I'm back. And yes, uh, thanks, Anjit, thanks, Andrew, for uh, explaining um, all the different methods in uh, imitation learning. I'm trying to reconcile it. And so behavior cloning and inter uh, with interactive expert and as well as inverse reinforcement learning are all forms of imitation learning in that we don't have a reward function readily available to us. And we, all, we, we want to figure out the best policy um, to take um, to solve a problem. Um, behavioral cloning and interactive experts variants are different from inverse reinforcement learning in that we are trying to um, find a very deterministic set of policies from, uh, from looking at our expert. Um, in inverse reinforcement learning, we are not necessarily trying to find the set of policies right away. First figure out what are the reward functions are for each of the states and from there may, um, maybe we can figure out the best policy. Um, as Jan Sanchin mentioned before, this is um, inverse reinforcement learning. It can be a bit problematic because um, the solutions are not deterministic and so you have a set of solutions. Um, and it will take a few work, um, some work to figure out what is the actually, actually the best solution. Um, so, one well, question is why can't we just do both? Why can't we just use behavioral cloning as well as inverse reinforcement learning um, to both find um, what are the best solutions and what are the reward functions um, for, for uh, the actions that we take. And um, so it, it was recently discovered that uh, using behavioral cloning and inverse reinforcement learning, uh, they are equivalent methods. Um, with a bit of work, you can recover the reward function, even if you're using behavioral cloning, and vice versa. Even if you're using inverse reinforcement learning, you can eventually find the best policy still. So, um, so those are the methods for imitation learning. And going forward, I'd like to recognize some of the limitations that imitation learning uh, may have. So, imitation learning can work really well if you have a very well-defined environment. Um, translation uh, states, you need to, uh, to have very uh, well-defined actions that you can take. Um, but the real world doesn't always work like that. Um, in the real world, um, there are variations to your problems. And using as one very particular expert, it may not work well for scenarios that are similar to the expert, but are not exactly the same. Um, you can think of it as um, learning how to drive a car, but can you apply it to learning how to drive a bus? Um, or a van <laughs> for a better example. Uh, for a human, um, that can be a very simple idea, transitioning from one problem to another one. But for a robot, that, that can be really hard. And so <coughs> we need to figure out how to uh, solve that. And imitation learning alone um, can be very problematic uh, when it faced with those kind of problems. Um, one way to uh, so this problem is um, mammal, and so I'm just gonna go briefly over it because this is um, some of the more advanced technique that's um, related to meta learning, uh, which is uh, translated into learning how to learn. And so, basically, in mammal, you are given um, and uh, basically a solution to a task and you analyze that uh, solution to figure out a function um, so that you can apply it to um, when faced with a similar problem. Um, it allows you to generalize um, yeah, the task that you have already seen 
and to apply that to tasks that you have not seen before. And so this helps with imitation learning, um, allows you to use um, an, a particular set of expert, but to apply it to um, other scenarios that you have not faced before. Um, and if you remember, this was an example that was um, that was shown earlier in in the lecture. Um, it's actually an extension of imitation learning. Um, it doesn't use just imitation learning. It uses imitation learning and mammal to learn um, how to uh, to teach the robotic systems how to pick things up. Um, for very similar objects, even though um, the set of experts only cover a very particular set of scenarios. Um, and so that is all we have for our imitation of the lectures. Uh, we'll love your feedback. Can you just say a little bit about what we'll see in your problem set? Mm, yes, so interesting for us to do. Yeah, so in our problem set, we are actually going to show a bit of behavioral cloning. Um, we are going to um, you, let you guys try out how to train um, you know, your set of policy from um, from the data set that we will provide. Good. <laughs> Any other questions? I have one question for uh, the uh, immersion reinforcement learning. So mm -hmm. as you said, the problem is very time constraint. Yeah. Uh, the same set of reward function or uh, a different set of reward function could be B to the same <coughs> solution, right? Same policy, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually. So so you have you said like you have probably like very large uh, set of uh, large region of like solution space that could be Turned out as a solution, right? Yeah. So, so how do you how do you choose from those? So you you, you said you said the, the problem is time constraint, but how do you eventually select the best one? Yeah. So um, I mean with conventional approaches, the problem was that there wasn't a good way to choose, right? So you can um, try to do something that's kind of in the center of your space somehow while also being constrained in size. Um, but there's no guarantee that that was uh, appropriate for the problem, which is why a lot of work has been done since then to further constrain that, and that's where the maximum entry approach is kind of the best way to constrain that, um, where you aren't over committing uh, to some non optimal policy having a much higher reward than another. Uh, so you kind of motivated the talk with manipulation. Um, I was just wondering. Like to what extent this has been applied, or like what type of manipulation tasks, and it wasn't very clear to me how, you know, for example, that, that one video you showed where it drops in the box. Mm -hmm. um, it's not clear to me if this is imitation learning being used to teach kind of the prehensile aspects of the task, or simply kind of learning what 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 the task is. It is. Where here it just seems to be kind of like dropping object in the box, but for manipulation there's like a huge array of challenges about like gripping right. variety of objects, manipulating these like within the gripper, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering just like if you could just talk to that a little bit and what happened to that uh, yeah, so this is kind of um, this is kind of a case where the state space of what the arm can do is a lot more undefined. So um, this probably uses this actually uses um, mammal, which is one of the techniques we talked about at the end. But it's kind of maps better to the uh, interactive expert uh, and the behavioral cloning side of things. Um, in this specific case, uh, the idea was that uh, I believe the robot was supposed to correctly identify that the reward state was dropping the ball in the red cup, um, and the object that it was manipulating was kind of constant throughout, so there weren't problems as to how you grip it and whatnot. Um, you can probably extend uh, some of imitation learning to the idea of gripping if you focus your data set, um, your expert data set on gripping of various objects, but in this case it was kind of identifying what the different objects were, um, and then placing it in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I also recommend reading the papers uh, from Berkeley. They are doing a huge amount of work on manipulation and imitation learning, especially like Peter Abiel, Sergio Levine. Um, yeah, and this is one of the examples, I think, 
uh, well, they learned from human action, but it was also learning from video, uh, learning to use novel uh, tools from video, like grasping, untying knots, uh, stuff like that. So strongly recommended. Uh, does that work? Does it does it use an end-to-end -end system where you feed in the raw pixel, or does it already assume that you have a good perception system where you can build a close on all objects and then you do the imitation learning uh, by providing the right object? Uh, this paper, I think, was end-to-end. -end. Okay, so it does. So basically, someone is is maybe joining like a labeling a set of pixels to respond to that to the object. In this case, no. Uh, I think you're talking about de-rendering, uh, which is also uh, a super popular. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. for that work, yeah, yeah, yeah can, can I elaborate? Uh, so de-rendering, uh, as no, I mean, oh, for this. this work, uh, this work, I only skimmed the abstract, um, but this was learning from. Uh, so they had two sets of uh, data. They had a human uh, data set, so videos of human doing a single action, and they had a correspondence of uh, robots doing that exact same action. Yeah. So they all put their correspondence. Yes. You have questions? Okay, let's thank the speakers. And please fill out your uh, feedback forms and give them to Marlies. Yeah, just uh, directly. <laughs> yeah, I think this was a paper more about mammal. Than about imitation. Yeah, they I had some cool. They had a cool video. So. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering why you do the inverse proof of learning. Can I quickly try this? Sure. I'm just super curious because uh, supposedly the phone like works with this, so yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm just it's very Oh, I'm actually Okay, how do I like to see some arguments with those? 
Yeah, we don't have to do that. No, it's like Yeah, we use. What? That's fine. Why do you wrap up? What do you? 